Good morning and a warm welcome to you. Uh, we meet once more in this way. This way of worshipping is still new, it's different, but the wonder is it draws us together, whether we're in church, whether we are listening in our own homes, watching by disc or watching online. God is very present with each one of us. I'll be on holiday for the next four Sundays, but I've recorded a service for each week and so it will be business as usual, as far as you're concerned. Any pastoral matters during my break will be covered by Lynn Mack. We are children of God, called to praise and to bless, to show mercy. We're citizens of a nation called to care and to respond and to share our freedom. We're members of a community called to know each other and to accept each other and to welcome all. We belong to God and through God to one another. So may our hearts be as one and let us worship our God. Give thanks to the Lord who is good. God's love is everlasting. Come, let us praise God joyfully. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us pray. For the church into which we've been called, for the good news we receive by word and sacrament, for our life together in the Lord, we praise you, God. For your Holy Spirit who guides our steps and brings us gifts of faith and love, who prays in us and prompts our grateful worship, we praise you, God. Above all, O God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and lives again for our salvation, for our hope in him and for the joy of serving him, we thank and praise you, eternal God. As we continue to pray in Jesus' name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Our reading today comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, reading verses 1 to 17. Hear the word of God. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they'd lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait till they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud and then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wherever you go, I will go, wherever.
nothing but death parts me from you. Let us pray. Your word, O God, is a book which sometimes we find hard to understand. As we worship now, open our ears, our hearts and our minds to hear you speak clearly. Amen. Where you go, I will go. What incredible words of loyalty these are from this young woman, Ruth, who had already experienced tragedy in her life. It would have been easy for her to agree to what her mother-in-law Naomi told her and her sister-in-law Orpa to do. All three of them had been widowed. Naomi had only made her home in this strange land when she and her husband Elimelech moved there and brought their boys up. So the land was not home for her, and without her husband, and then enduring the deaths of both sons, Naomi felt it was time to go back because nothing held her there any longer, even though she had good daughters-in-law. For her, it was the end of the line. But stay here, she told her daughters-in-law, make a new life. Of course, as always, when we read a story from those early days of God's people, we can miss the context because it isn't immediately obvious. When a woman married a man in that world, she was regarded as the means of carrying on the family name. Such were the levels of mortality that if the woman's husband died, then she was expected to marry his brother and have a family. And any children born were then regarded as the children of the first husband. Such was the order of families. But both Naomi's sons were dead and in this foreign land she saw that her family was at an end. It was time to go home. Stay here and make a new life. Mine is over, she told Orpah and Ruth. And Orpah turned round and returned to her family, and Ruth hesitated. I suspect we'll never know what brought Ruth to that decision, but what a choice to make. Was it her sense of her own bereavement? Was that so deep that she felt life had ended too, and she wanted to escape her memories? Maybe she didn't have any strong family ties of her own and so she grasped the chance to begin again. Maybe she realised the depth of Naomi's loss, losing husband and both sons, and had such compassion on her that she felt she couldn't abandon her. It's also possible she understood that the only way to carry on her husband's name was to find one of her ki- his kin who would marry her. We'll never know what she was thinking. What we do know, however, are those beautiful words she uttered. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. No matter how you view her motives, Ruth's decision was a brave one and she set out with total commitment to something new and alien, even down to the matter of faith. Now the rest of the book of Ruth tells us what happened. You may know the story very well or you may be unsure of the outcome. Read it for yourself and find out. But here's the spoiler. Ruth didn't remarry. She carried on her first husband's name. But she also found love and joy and fulfilment in life. The hard choices that she made reaped rewards. 
and one of those she never knew about. When she returned to Bethlehem and married Boaz, they had a son, Obed, whose grandson was David. It was from the line of David that Joseph took his family roots and why he and Mary were in Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. All because a young woman called Ruth took decisions that meant far from limiting herself to the safe, to the secure environment of her own family, she was willing to be open to caring for others, taking risks and embracing a world she didn't know with its faith, its customs and its people. Family was redefined. Jesus redefined family too. Can you remember him reintroducing Mary and John as he faced his death? They already knew each other, but in that moment, Jesus invited their, them to see that their relationship to him drew them even closer. In chapter nineteen of John, we read John nine. Sorry, in chapter nineteen of John, we read when Jesus saw his mother standing there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, "Woman, here is your son." And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. And that's exactly what John did. Even though Mary had other children of her own, it was John who took her into his home and cared for her until the end of his life. Those two interpretations of family point us to the truth that Living a life of faith widens our understanding of our family circle. It makes us brothers and sisters in faith, owning God as Heavenly Father. That has important implications for the way we live and respond to others. We may not always like them. We don't have to approve of their choices or their actions, but we're to love them, pray for them, and serve them wholeheartedly as Ruth did. We're to welcome one another and care for each other. We're to reach out and gather others in. In these days as we emerge from this pandemic, it's important as a church community that we recognise our kinship to the people we live among and serve. We are family. Glory to the Father, to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We pause now in our time for giving. Let us pray. God of Ruth and Naomi, of hope in bitterness, harvest in hunger, life in death, we often focus on our losses and lacks, make us conscious of the blessings and make us as open-handed in our giving as in our taking. 
This day we offer our prayers for those who are bereaved. We remember those for whom the loss is recent and a gaping wound. Those who struggle to come to terms with their loss and for whom the scars never seem to heal. Those who travel on faithfully and hopefully, but knowing that there are gaps in their lives. We pray for those who are at a crossroads in their lives. Young people trying to look forward and prepare for the future. Those preparing for a change of direction. Those who feel they have no future and are without hope. We pray for those who live with poor health, physically or mentally. Those facing medical investigations or difficult diagnoses. Those who care for them and support them, both paid employees and family members. We pray for men, women and men living in poverty and taking risks to feed their families. For children going hungry in our own town and lacking the basics we believe are normal. We pray for those who work with them and for them. We pray for those whose lives have gone out of control for any reason. Poverty, health, ignorance, will, poor decision and those who've been easily led. What a great world it would be if we created a new community out of disparate types of people as Jesus did. God, we pray for your earthly family that they may know the fullness of your love. What a great world it would be, God our friend, if we kept all our lives grafted in Christ, the true vine, and like good branches produced the bountiful fruits of his spirit. God, we pray for your earthly family, that they may know the fullness of your love. Loving God, keep us close to Christ. Let his spirit flow within us, healing our defects and enabling us to produce the fruits of love both in and out of season, to the glory of your name. Amen. Thank you.
Now go in peace, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon and remain with you this day and always. Amen.